I am really driven by the social need of farms and to utilize the land for the benefit of our neighbors in the form of really good food. My best friend, 27 years ago, told me about this gondola and, you know, me being a painter and all, she's like, you know, you might need a side gig at some point. I really enjoyed it and, uh, well, been here for a long time now. Being suspended, like the whole world's moving, but you aren't if you don't want to. You don't weigh anything, but you weigh everything. Our bakery is known as Mom's Apple Pie Company, and we make pies. We make really genuine pies with a lot of fruit and not too much sugar. Which ones are we picking? The purple ones? We are a truly farm-to-table bakery in that we, we make it all from scratch. When we were younger, our, our farming business did not succeed. It was uh, in the late 70s and uh, as a, a means to stay on our feet we started baking pies with a friend of mine who had started making a few pies on weekends and selling them to our farm market and uh, she said why don't we do this together and so we started doing this together and she lost interest and, and moved on with her husband and we stayed doing that. We got really yeah, efficient. No, My wife awesome. could make a pie in a matter of seconds, and I could peel a bushel of apples in eight minutes. Actually, uh, within a year or two, we supplied one farm market with 900 <laughs> real pies in one day. Of course, that took working around the clock. I've always wanted to be a part of a farming community and be part of growing food. I met my husband when I was a teenager working at a farm market that he and his brother co-owned. And, uh, and I, I very much enjoyed that job, both in the farm market and in the fields picking, picking produce. So I've liked the concept of this uh, very much. Also because it's a, a steady life. We bought this farm in uh, 1997. And we're on the banks of the Potomac, uh, right across from Maryland. It's a somewhat a historic location in that during the Civil War, the Confederate troops marched through the end of our farm across the Potomac to Antietam. So there's some orange pumpkins. At this point in my career, I am really driven by the social need of farms. I try to work to educate people on the importance of farms. I, I belong to Farm Bureau. I belong to a couple of rural economic groups here in our county in Loudoun. And we are working really hard to let people know how important it is to save properties like this one from being developed and to utilize the land for the benefit of, of our neighbors in the form of really good food. The uh, Community Supported Agriculture, the CSAs, seem to provide a, a means to capture a certain market of people that still want to cook. Even though the population is uh, maybe five times greater in this area than it was then, uh, the number of people that want to cook isn't. I'm Tyson Cox. I am Avis and Steve's son. Most of the year I am the farm manager uh, and that is mostly uh, with the rotation of crops, prepping fields, planting, and uh, organizing uh, what produce we need throughout the year for our CSA. He didn't think that he would do that. He, he wasn't too happy about doing that as a teenager. It took him away from his friends a lot of times, and it was hard work. But uh, ultimately, he ended up deciding that this might be a really great thing for him to do. He works with his dad, and we have all the um, commensurate uh, joys and, and terrors of a farm farm family and an intergenerational business that we are working through and for the most part we still love each other. It's sort of interesting. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's got its challenges, you know. Sometimes I just want to yell at them. Come on. Come on. 
<laughs> and sometimes I do yell at them. Uh, but all in all, it's, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, incredibly lucky for all the sacrifices they've made in, um, in buying this farm and keeping their family business going. As we go into uh, the latter half of the year, October, November, and December, uh, I transition from that into, you could say, head baker. Even though it's called Mom's Apple Pie Company, we do many more than just apple pie flavors. We do blackberries and raspberries and strawberry rhubarb pie, all of which we grow on the farm. Um, we also make quiches that we use our own fresh farm eggs for. We're about to harvest all the corn for our corn quiche, which we also incorporate fresh sage and bell peppers and onions that we grow here on the farm. I didn't know he would upset. This is my daughter, Ansa, who's usually in the office managing all of the important affairs that none of the rest of us want to do. <laughs> <laughs> but once in a while, she's in the kitchen when we need her. And her forte is wrapping. And she's the one that usually ends up overnight wrapping the pies so that they're ready to go in the morning when the truck shows up. You try the yellow kind. This is your grandpa's favorite. I have a 10-month-old now, and I, you know. <laughs> I guess it'd be really nice to farm with him when he grows up. I certainly didn't expect to be in the business for 40 years, but it ended up marrying nicely with the farming business. It's authentic. You know, nothing we do is that crazy. It's a really simple recipe. You know, I think our apple pie's got seven ingredients, sure. but it's using really high quality yes, butter and making on all butter crust um, but and baking them fresh every day. So a lot of it is just doing something simple very well. We're all still looking for the secrets of, of staying happy. Nothing is more important than the relationship that you have with your family. Oh my God, it's so good. And making sure to Retain that at all costs is really important for the business and for the family. Beautiful in Central Park. My name is Andres Garcia Pena. Uh, I am a gondolier in Central Park for 27 years, and I am also an artist, a painter. Basically, my uh, best friend was the chef at the boathouse 27 years ago. And uh, she told me about this gondola. Uh, and, you know, me being a painter and all, she's like, you know, you might need a side gig at some point. And uh, when I came to see the boat, I was just, just very uh, uh, impressed by an authentic Venetian gondola in New York City. And I kind of just really wanted to learn how to, how to, how to row it, you know. And uh, back then, the boathouse was a fraction of what it is today. It wasn't really that busy or whatever, but I really enjoyed it and, uh, and uh, well, been here for a long time now. It took me a couple of days just to get the boat going straight, you know? Uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a hard thing to do, actually. I mean, like anything, you know, practice makes perfect. Most people think it's just a tourist thing, but it's not. You know, it's, it's date night for New Yorkers. But, you know, of course, we do get a lot of tourists uh, with the pandemic and stuff. You know, we don't get the international tourists that we used to. You know, over the years, people from all over, all uh, a strata of, you know, e e economy. I mean, we're right by Fifth Avenue, the richest part of, a, of the world probably. But the, the gondola ride is not expensive. And, you know, I, got, I have uh, kids, uh, you know, on prom night coming with their girlfriends doing the gondola. So, you know, it's, it's, it's everybody.
it's really kind of a, a very special uh, job because I, I get to see people that are happy, number one, do, celebrating romance, celebrating birthdays, anniversaries, guys proposing. But you know, one, one thing that you, know, you, do, you do, you know, experience is that seeing true love, seeing people that are really in love with each other and coming on gondola rides, you know, it's just good vibes. It's a good, good thing for me. And I, and it, and I facilitate that, you know, uh, their romance by telling them the history of the park and the history about kissing under the bridge. And I sing romantic songs to them. Frederick Law Olmsted, the designer of Central Park, he designed uh, this lake with Venetian gondolas in, uh, in mind. 1872, when Central Park opened its doors to the public, uh, there was a fleet of gondolas here with authentic Venetian gondoliers, not imposters like me. There were about half a dozen Venetian gondolas here uh, giving rides. Um, Bethesda Terrace was a very fancy part where the hoity-toity would come up in their horse and buggies in the late 1800s. There was a restaurant, music underneath the arches there at the Bethesda Terrace. So this gondola has been here for, th hey Ray, nice to see you sir, nice to see you. Central Park, uh, the best fisherman in Central Park right there. No, no, I'm not pointing at you Ray, I'm pointing at her. Yeah, her. She's amazing. So. Um, so this gondola has been here for 37 years, and I would say it was approximately a 20-year-old gondola when, when it arrived. So this is about, about a 60-year-old uh, 60 gondola. It's pretty much everything about this job is feel good. That's why I think I've been doing it this long. You know, being a painter, I'm in my studio alone. I thrive for that. That's what that's, that's what makes me happy, and uh, that's like my, my primary, you know, thing that I love to do. So it's nice to have a job where you basically just positive energy, meeting people that are happy, explaining to them about the the the, the most beautiful park in the world. Perfect day for romance at the boathouse in Central Park. Uh, so I've been painting obviously a lot longer since uh, uh, th th that I've been a gondolier. Been painting pretty much all my life. And uh, when I first started doing the gondola, basically I was doing, I did the gondola of my first 14 years, I did it seven days a week, which allowed me to just, just work and save money and then basically work for like five, six months, and then I'd be off for six months and not have to worry about money. And so I've always uh, made art, you know, that, that I like to make. And I, you know, I, I, it, it's not, maybe not commercial, and, uh, and I don't care. I've always uh, found uh, that, you know, uh, you can make money other ways. I've had some, like, uh, you know, success with certain series that I did more than others where I was able to make money. But doing the gondola basically allows me to have a great time and then be able to paint what I want and um, not sell out. Vido guare quante bello, spira tanto sentimento, come tuvo suava cento, che ni desto fa sorna. We're just going to the uh, end of my pier, my property, and we're going to see Oyster City, which is a, uh, a city and a marina that I built on two big floats. I wanted to draw attention to 
oysters and how important they are to the bay. And I thought if I could create awareness, um, and this, this absolutely draws an amazing amount of boaters over the weekend. People come by, they take pictures, and it has oyster facts, and it just tries to educate the public a little bit about the importance of oysters and what they mean to the Chesapeake Bay. It basically all started at a, I uh, went to a fundraiser for the Chesapeake Bay, and um, it was actually uh, a big like, oyster roast, and they were shucking oysters, and they had a display where they took some very, very cloudy water that you couldn't really see through, and they put two oysters in there, and they told me to come back in a half an hour, and they told me the water would be crystal clear, because oysters filter 50 gallons of water daily. And uh, sure enough, when I came back, that water was crystal clear, and I was just, uh, I was, it was very compelling. And uh, I just thought, boy, if there was more oysters back in the bay, it could help clean the bay up. So I just decided to create a hobby with this and build my own reefs. What I have here is a actual reef that I designed into a boat lift that you can you know, articulate, you can bring it up so you can see it clear because the water is very murky in the Chesapeake Bay. So basically for kids that like to come to my house and see what I'm doing, you can't really show them an oyster reef because you can't see it through the, uh, the, the water. So I actually built a reef that I can bring up and so kids can get a better understanding of how oysters grow on a reef. And these are three reef balls right in here that I had in the setting tank last year. And I, the microscopic larva swam, they set, and now they've been growing. And those are all oysters growing on those reef balls. And I built a water wheel that I incorporated in that has a pump. And as that spins and it throws water down, it oxygenates this reef. So it's uh, quite a neat little habitat. Uh, they're amazing filtering machines. They actually, oyster reefs, create habitat for fish to spawn and to uh, grow and for protection. Um, they're also delicious, nutritional, an amazing uh, food source because they have such a benefit uh, to the environment as well as to uh, your eating health. They're loaded with uh, vitamins and nutrients that you can't get uh, in most foods. Oysters population in the Chesapeake Bay um, is only historically today at 1% of what it was. And there were enough oysters in the bay like the turn of the century where the bay would be filtered every day. Now there's only 1% of that, so it can take a year before it can get the filtering properties. If I've been in the process of building a reef for four years, uh, right at, right uh, around the bend of the Severn River. My reef is right over here where the green number 13 shallow water marker is. And I collect shells from five different restaurants uh, that, uh, that serve oysters and I pick up the shells and I let the shells heat up in the sun and get all the biomaterial off of them and then I plant them out on the reef. All of these oysters here on this property, which is about a total of 6,000, will go out on the reef within the next few weeks. And I probably now have a total of 30,000 oysters growing there. I would say right now with the amount of oysters that I have on that reef, they can filter probably about 150,000 gallons of water daily. I put them in buckets and then I just take my boat out to the reef, and then I just scatter them on the reef. It's the next best thing to being in space. It's the weightlessness. It's, it's the same feeling, I would suppose, as astronauts feel, you know, when they're up there. But we're down here in this beautiful world, and it is also a weightless, beautiful world. Just being suspended, like the whole world's moving, but you aren't if you don't want to. And you, you, you don't weigh anything, but you weigh everything. The whole thing is kind of there. 
it's a perfectly preserved ecosystem here because uh, no fishing, no poaching, nothing, none of that is allowed on the property at all. Primarily it's a scuba park um, for training and then to keep your skills up as a, as a diver. Um, we are a campground as well. So you can bring your RV in, um, your family, and we have 50 amp, 30 amp hookups for your RV, um, water, and a dump station on the way out. The helicopter. Um, so we submerged that. That came from the Navy and <clears throat> muchly appreciated. It was fun to sink. Um, but other things we get from from donations, a car here or a, or, or a, a bus, um, we prep it to get it ready for the water so there's no harmful chemicals or oils that are left behind. My favorite under, underwater attraction would be the plane. Um, if you go down to about 50 feet and then you swim towards that plane, just the size of it as you come up to it is breathtaking. We have people coming from Delaware, Maryland, D.C., sometimes, you know, North Carolina. But whatever your favorite food is, every time you eat it, there's a new experience. Mm -hmm. We had a new experience today. And when we dive later on in the day, it'll be a new experience. The plane's mm -hmm. been there for years. We've dove yeah. it there for years. We're shouldering almost 90 to 100 pounds of gear on us before we get in the water. And once we get in the water, all of that becomes neutral and, and weightless. But to that point, you have to get from point A to point B. <laughs> you got to get it. We have to learn how to react to the environment as the environment changes. All of a sudden, you're diving, and all of a sudden, some haze comes through, algae comes through. It, it, it decreases your visibility, which means that our team skills have to get tighter and closer. That means we have to even get closer. We have to learn how to be able to manage problems and manage failures while we're underwater and still keep each other safe and bring each other home. We have been pretty fortunate. Um, people needed a place to go. Um, this is outside. And go scuba diving. You don't have a minimum distance underneath the water. People dive all year round. Diving's great everywhere. There is no bad diving, all right? A dirty water hole, if you're under the water, it's a good day of diving. I've messed up some dives, but I've never had a bad day diving.